Welcome to the Pharmacy Inspection Podcast, where we discuss topics related to sterile and non-sterile compounding pharmacy in an effort to promote compliance and increase quality. Please welcome your hosts, Brian Prince and Seth DePasquale. Hello, pharmacy colleagues and friends, and welcome to another episode of the Pharmacy Inspection Podcast. This is Sethi Pasquale, your friendly compounding pharmacist, and as promised, we have a guest on this week. We'll be talking a little bit more about my engineering issues I had with USP 800 and how we overcame those, but more specifically, our guests will be discussing some of the typical obstacles that pharmacies see when trying to build a compliant clean room. Brian, I'm going to let you do a little bit more of an introduction since you guys have actually worked on some projects together, so here you go. Sean Valandra and I were introduced through a mutual industry contact because Sean had actually gone in uh, into their pharmacy and worked with them and, and got all their air handling needs taken care of. Uh, and me doing facility design, we were introduced because my friend said, hey, you've got to meet this guy. And I know that the, he said the same thing to Sean. And when we made this connection, it was, again, it was just a wonderful thing because he understands the things that I don't and vice versa. I get the workflow. I understand where people are handling powder. I understand the safety. I understand hoods. I understand that everything that's happening below the ceiling. And then Sean understands everything that's happening above the ceiling. So it has really been a, a wonderful working relationship to rely on each other's knowledge base. So Sean, why don't you tell us about your background and how you got into this? My name is Sean Valandra. I am the owner of SB Environmental Consulting and SB Filtration. My background has been in air filtration for the last 20 years uh, with an emphasis on industrial air filtration. Um, and I've done a lot of work in vitamin plants, in CGMP and GMP. Uh, I was uh, asked to come in and uh, fix a, uh, an issue in a pharmacy in regards to a dust collection centralized powder hood system that somebody had created an issue and uh, they, they needed to fix it with existing components. I was able to make it work, not having to do a lot of infrastructure change. And the owner of the, or the CEO of the uh, pharmacy was happy with what I had done. It asked me to help him design and put together a chemo lab. So from there, he handed me the USP guide and I went through it and found out that Everything that I had been doing for the last 20 years was a lot, it, it paralleled this and the scales were the only difference between what I had done and what I am now into. And from there, I was recommended to do a, a large uh, USB 800 pharmacy uh, using a uh, customer's concepts and uh, it worked out really well. And it's just been growing from there. Um, which is ironic because my, uh, my background's in engineering and architecture and I ended up getting a business degree, but the road for air, con air filtration and all these other parts and components, it just wasn't something that I uh, had even thought about way back when. So last week, Seth walked us through some of the issues he was having trying to get his clean room to be negative pressure and compliant with USB 800. And what he found, which you and I commonly see, is that the air changes were too high. And because of that, and I think he said he was getting about 60 air changes and that high number was also pulling air from other spaces. Those other spaces were, un you know, unconditioned spaces. So he was consistently finding through environmental monitoring tests that they were getting contamination. And I know that you and I have talked about this a lot, Sean, is that higher air changes is not necessarily the best methodology to accomplishing USP 800 and sterility. Well, one of the one of the topics that I always bring up when we talk about this between between us is that the reason that the ISO classes were created was that clean room standards class 10,000, class 1,000, class 100,000. One of the key items in regards to laminar flow in semiconductor or clean rooms is that there's laminar flow, which means you need to have a percentage of, of ceiling needs to be FFUs. It ends up being where you have a higher air change, um, uh, amount of air changes, and you end up with uh, more uh, FFUs than you need, and it's a waste of 
a waste of resources, a waste of energy, a waste of money. Well, the ISO classes were created because to basically state what the air changes are without having certain criteria from the clean room standards. Uh, and one of the issues with that is that clean rooms are always worried about your uh, parts per million of particulate in the air. A lot of the larger companies, they will use that and they will warp the ISO so that they can use that clean room standard. It sells more equipment and it's also what they're used to. And that's where you end up spending a lot more money and time and, and resources to uh, use something that is not really even necessarily meant for this industry. It wasn't created for it and USP has been moving away from it for a while. Right. Yeah. So what, what we found on, on quite a few of our projects is that the air changes per hour are too high. And I know that Seth had also identified that situation. Seth had to uh, accurately say that, that you had also identified that you were getting about 60 air changes and you decided that it was be, it would be best to dial that down. Yeah. When we had an air balancer come in and look at the room, look at all the different air changes that were that were going on in each room they were, they were at about 60 air changes per hour. And that was his recommendation. Well, let's, let's turn this down a little bit <laughs> and um, let's dial down the exhaust. Cause I think we were exhausting at that point, uh, man. And you guys are, are going to laugh, but you know, upwards of like, I want to say like 1500 CFM through our, through our, like the exhaust uh, that was connected to the BSC. And he was like, this is just, you guys are exhausting beyond what you should be exhausting. So we turned that way down. Um, we in a, inevitably also the air changes went, went down quite a bit. And now we're, we're, you know, we're in the, in some rooms, we're, we're in the 30 to 35 to 40 air changes per hour range. And then in, in, in one, maybe one of the rooms we might be around 45 air changes per hour. Um, but drastically different from the, the 60 air changes per hour in, in almost every room <laughs> prior to uh, that air balancer coming. Hmm. So, yeah. So you remember last week I said that the solution was dilution. Uh, yeah. And Sean kind of alluded to that also is that um, those ISO standards, they just want to fill so much of the ceiling space to give as much coverage with fan filter units to dilute, dilute, dilute. And USP says, you know, we don't have to have those numbers. So I think uh, what you're finding, Seth, is that even though you're not pushing 60 to 90 air changes, which uh, Sean and I commonly see out there on projects that were coming in halfway or in one situation a couple of years later, um, that, you know what, you can still maintain your ISO standards at 35 to 45 air changes. Is there any requirements for a set number of air changes per hour within any of the ISO standards? Like I know I've heard that like, if you have an ISO five room, you have to have a hundred percent coverage. Basically the entire ceiling has to be HEPA filters. Um, is there well, a well, requirement? Go, go ahead, Sean. Yes, 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 there is. But uh, ISO five is at that point, you, you have so many air changes that even with full ceiling coverage, you, you might have a hard time even getting the amount of air through there as you need. That's, that's below ISO 7 is where things start to get very murky and it starts to go really fast and to a point where um, ISO 7, you can get away with not, you, your FFUs will push up to 700 CFM each. You don't need as much ceiling coverage, but when you get down to ISO 5 and also whether the room is, 10 by 10 or 100 by 100, you end up needing so much air through those FFUs that you're going to push them to the limit to even get it done. Right. Yeah. So if you if you look at um, the standards for an ISO 5 room, the air changes per hour should be above 240. It's like, and I may misspeak here, but I think it's 240 to 480 is the number of air right changes. Too. Yeah. Um, but again, that's a standard that was set out there and was not even addressed in USP uh, 797, 800. And none of the chapters in the compounding compendium even address ISO 5. And where we're seeing that out in the field is for those pharmacies that are doing lyophilization, right? And the FDA has told those folks and sent out word and however they've got the message that 
if you're doing lyophilization, they want to see it in an ISO 5 environment. So even though USP didn't address it and it's not a GMP facility, do you have to live by those 240 air changes per hour? I, I don't know. Yeah, everything that I looked up when I was asked about that, that particular question was, it was, there's just not a lot of printed detail on it. And if you think about it, a lot of these hoods, they're actually, the space within the hood has a uh, ISO 5 classification. But you're also talking about the size of a microwave, very small amount of space. So it's a high volume of air and you can get those air changes if you were to measure it out by uh, the velocity and everything and all the air that's going through there you can get it measured out but the bottom line is the iso 5 is something that you're there's my thought is there's going to be more development on it because it's there's a reason that they hadn't uh, brought up anything specific about it yet that it's still a little bit fluid and to even get into it right now might be a little premature so last week, Seth told us about the, uh, and tell me, how, how did you phrase it, Seth? You bought, you were buying a, a, a brand new car with the price tag that you put on your makeup air unit? Yeah, yeah. We we bought a a Mercedes of a of a desiccant dehumidifier. <laughs> and oh, yeah. uh, it is, uh, it is the, the unit that handles all the air within the, the clean room environment. And it, you know, one of our goals was to keep our our humidity below forty five percent, with also a temperature of uh, below sixty eight degrees F. And this this unit does a great job of doing that. Um, the room was originally spec'd out to just use a a five ton unit, and and that just did not get the job done. Not even not not even well, close. No, and that's what the problem is with uh, package units in regards to temperature is that your uh, for a non-sterile space, 72 degrees as a target with a swing of 5 degrees up or down, that's, that'll work based on the amount of coil and the DX, the uh, refrigerant and how it works. Um, but where things start to get very – they start to get uh, – you, you got to put a little more thought into it and look at special units is – uh, whether it's 100% outside air or uh, 80% recirculation for a sterile 797 space, you end up needing a unit that super cools the air down to 40 degrees and then reheats the dry air to a comfort level of 67 to 68 degrees. That's that's how uh, that's how it should be done properly. Um, you can handle your cooling and your dehumidification separately. But you're going to end up with a yo-yo effect where the two are going to end up kind of working against each other and working uh, working so that you, you have a variation over and over, which is the reason that uh, we're, we've looked at using primarily Aon units because we can customize them to what we need. And whether it's 100% makeup air or 80% uh, recirculated, 20% outside air for a 797 space, those units, they're beyond a standard package. They are rated and made to be able to do more duty in a way that, that a standard five-ton package, as an instance, can actually do. Does that, does that make sense? Well, I think, I think you know, that is the, the big misunderstanding. And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of bad information out there when you get an engineer on the phone talking to you about some of this stuff that, you know, has a lot of experience. I think people underestimate the, you know, all the stuff that goes into this and, and, and everything that you just said in terms of, you know, the percentages of outside air versus recirculated and, and it, all this stuff is so relevant to the project that I just went through and, and trying to re remediate the entire thing. And you basically just went down a checklist of, of things that we did. <laughs> So one of the most common questions that you and I encounter when we start a new design project uh, from the pharmacy owners is, do you think I'm going to be able to use my existing HVAC equipment for USP 800? Yes. And the answer 95% of the time in regards to non-sterile HD is no. 
There are some circumstances in which if the lab is small enough, using a percentage of outside air from an existing unit could work. But in regards to sterile HD, the answer is no, because the temperature that USPS uh, has or is going to set for 797 and uh, sterile HD is 68 degrees, and regular package equipment uh, cannot handle getting to that temperature in a stable way. Right. So what I tell folks, too, is that their standard commercial package unit, uh, even on the, on the non-sterile side, um, is that a standard package HVAC unit is going to get four to six, maybe eight air changes per hour. Now we're going to ask yeah. a space, and let's just say it's a small space. Let's say it's a 10 by 10 by 9 space, right? That's our cube. And they're going to have to process between 400 and 600 CFM into that small space, but then 100% of that air is going out of the building. It just is unlikely that a standard package unit is going to be re going to be able to consistently replace even that small volume of air. So, again, we get to the point of can can your existing HVAC equipment handle that volume when we know that 100% of that volume is leaving the building and has to be replaced? Well, that's and that's where recirculated versus single pass units the difference between the two. A regular air conditioner on your house, on your office, it recirculates. It goes 90, 80 to 90 percent of the air gets goes back through the unit over and over and over. Each time it goes through the coil, it drops a degree. Well, if you if you are bringing in new air and you cannot use the sort cycles to drop the temperature, you are stuck with whatever temperature is outside, which normally in the summer being the issue. That's 90 degrees. You can't drop it more than one degree. So great points about choosing the right unit up front, understanding the person uh, who is going to size that for you is, is basing on the ASHRAE table. They understand exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve. And this is where some of the tugs of war happen with some mechanical engineers and other areas because they don't understand that it is 100 percent recirculated air. It's 100 percent. I'm sorry, it's 100 percent exhausted air. It's 100 percent replenishment of air in a USP 800 environment. But there's that other factor in choosing, Sean, that we've run into, and we had this conversation not too long ago with a client, is that everything was wonderful, fine and dandy until they cut on the equipment. They cut on, you know, the autoclave or the convection, and then the hoods came on, and the next thing you know, the room fell out of spec. So why is it so important to understand the how equipment and people put off and, and change the environment? Well, the uh, what I've found is that we make some general assumptions about equipment, about people, the heat off of people, and regards to our air change. We, in a complete recirculation, or sorry, 80% recirculation, we use two degrees as our thermal rise. That, when you're talking about 30 to 45 air changes per hour, as long as the room is not too big and you don't have a blast furnace in there, your that two degrees is going to be just fine. The heat's going to be pulled out of there. Your coil is on your air conditioner is not going to. It's going to have the ability to push down below that temperature or push the heat out, flush it out, and bring the air back in. And it, there won't be an issue there. Um, but what you got to be careful of is how your room's set up. Make sure that you have a water vapor uh, envelope. Uh, a, vapor, a vapor envelope so that you you can isolate your room well enough from the space around it. Um, I think of a, a, a structures in a completely different avenue, a structures lab where they were doing uh, bonding of composite materials and they had to stay within a certain spec for that for aircraft. Well, it was it was fine to think about doing this this humidity controlled space within this big giant hangar. Only problem was it was forced air evap in the entire hangar other than this room. So they asked they asked my company to create a clean room inside of a rainforest. And that became really tough because every the, the vapor barrier that we had to put in place had to be really, really tight because opening the door, water vapor moves at the speed of sound and it will go against airflow. It'll it come through every crack. It'll come through concrete, gypsum, and it did. It would force its way through. And it was uh, it was very difficult to to get there. We did we managed to pull it off, but it was a lot harder to get there because that forty to fifty percent we wanted to target was so far below 
in regards to the relative, relative humidity in re, uh, versus the space outside of that room that it was an issue. Wow. So if let's relate this to the to, to Seth's situation is that he found that his envelope, which was his room, um, was not as tight as it needed to be, and that the room was actually pulling in air. Now, part of the problem was too many air changes and the room was too negative. We established that. But the envelope itself was also probably pulling in particles from the, the mezzanine space or interstitial space, the plenum space above that room, which was not a conditioned space, as well as around cracks and walls and light switches. So do you feel like when you're, when you're designing the envelope, is it important to take into account how many penetrations are going to be in the wall as well? Well, it, it makes the most sense to follow certain guidelines and understand what you're doing and where you're going to end up in regards to uh, how many leaks you have. Dampers on the FFUs and the uh, re laminar low returns in a given space, those are very important. If you have too negative of a space, that means you have an imbalance somewhere and that you need to change that variable to make it so that you aren't, you aren't you aren't necessarily pulling too hard to get that pressure situation that you're looking for, your 0.01 to 0.03. So your air in and air out has to be has to be variable and has to be adjustable and, and not you don't want to pull too hard or push too hard to get to that variable that you need that um, uh, set point. Now, if you look at your ceiling, if you're using a regular commercial grid and you're using regular commercial tiles, well, that's part of your problem right there. Unless you're going to go through and caulk every one of those tiles and every part of that grid, you have a leaky ceiling. Your outlets and your switches, you, it really would make sense to treat them like they're, um, that this is like a, a class, class one or class two div one, where it's an explosion, uh, explosion rated space, where you seal up the conduit and the and the uh, the light switches and everything with either fire caulk or some kind of foam. But in this particular case, unless it's a clean room ceiling, I'm willing to bet that the tiles and how they're sealed or clipped, they're probably or whether there's gasket on the uh, on the ceiling grid. I'm willing to bet that was probably your your biggest gremlin that you 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 may not even have been able to get it under control along with the lights themselves. Yeah, we definitely had uh, caulked multiple times, and you know, Brian said this a couple times um, in the, in the last show that you're never going to make the envelope necessarily so tight that you're you're in a spaceship, um, but that being said, you can definitely make it a whole lot tighter with just some of the structural materials that you're using <laughs> um, yeah. inherently, not using, a, you know, your typical, I guess, like you're saying, the commercial grade ceiling tiles, you know, they're, they're really leaky. Yeah. So what would you, and this is, this is going to go off in a little bit of a, a tangent perhaps, but what, what would you recommend for, um, you know, a, a ceiling, what would be a proper infrastructure for, for a ceiling to, to kind of help well, with that situation? The easiest and the least costly is a hard ceiling, a hard lid. Um, the only problem with that is accessibility. And once you put something up there, it, it just becomes an issue of being able to get above that space for any number of reasons. Uh, a clean room grid, a structural grid, two inches, with vinyl rock tiles instead of vinyl face tiles uh, with gaskets on the grid and clips. You still may end up needing to gasket some of it with caulk, but that will get you going down the uh, direction that you need to go. And the other, uh, the other recommendation I have is LED lights. Uh, they are sealed better and they, they consume less energy and all around they're just a better choice. Um, they might cost about maybe twice as much as uh, regular ballast fluorescence, but in the long run, you're better off with the LEDs. This has been a really great and informative conversation and lots of awesome points, guys. I appreciate the, the interaction. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we're coming up on that 
25 minute time when, you know, we always try to wrap our podcast to make them manageable for our audience to be able to listen to in a timely fashion. And so I've got to kind of just recap here. We've talked about how important the envelope is for negative pressure and how that negative pressure can penetrate through walls and light fixtures and ceiling tiles and just the importance around designing the envelope for the process as well as the heat gain from people and from equipment and how to account for that when sizing out a makeup air unit. And we were just about to get into a discussion about biological safety cabinets, redundant HEPA hoods, and how those will and can affect the airflow. This conversation that we had recorded with Sean actually went longer than an hour. So we're going to break it up into two segments. So join us next week as we continue on with this conversation with Sean Valandra. And in the meantime, thanks for joining us and keep raising the bar.